Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we've heard things about the cosmos. We've listened to very inspiring talks from the arts. And uh, I'm going to be taking you through a journey down into the micro and nano. Uh, and I want to motivate my talk by talking about uh, energy and energy storage. Uh, we have uh, in, well, we have uh, from many, many years ago, uh, little capacitors with little wires. Uh, we have uh, taken that technology and put it onto planar films uh, in silicon microelectronics. These days, we even have flexible devices that can be displays, can be uh, components of cell phones and so forth, uh, and where it starts getting into very high energies is in the domain of supercapacitors, electric vehicles, and those types of technologies. Uh, so I've, I've mentioned these things uh, in these, this laundry list of different applications. But let me just say that when we think about capturing solar energy with solar panels, ultimately what we need to do is to convert that DC current into an AC current that will drive the things that we use. And so for these so-called power applications and power inverters, uh, these dielectric materials, these capacitors, are very uh, important components. So let me just tell you a little bit about the materials. Uh, we have uh, uh, been doing experimentation and research in the area of uh, chemically modified silicates. And that's what we have uh, up in these white panels here. Uh, so we take these particular precursors, and we put them together, and we make sort of network solids out of these materials in thin film form. If we apply an electric field to these molecules or to these materials, the, uh, the groups that are highlighted in blue there have a dipole moment, which means that if we subject it to a electric field, they will undergo some type of alignment and get what we would say polarized. And that is illustrated here in this bottom panel where we can see that there's a net orientation of these groups that are now highlighted in red. OK. So if we look at it from more of a molecular picture, uh, it would look something like this. In the top, the different groups are completely randomized. In the bottom panel, we have a relatively high degree of order and alignment of these molecules that, uh, that basically give us a separation of charges between the two electrodes. And that is a, a way of storing energy that we can release later. OK. And we just recently published a paper on this work in advanced energy materials. Uh, one of my postdocs is very good with animations and uh, graphics. And he came up with, from just a few suggestions on my part, came up with uh, this really intriguing picture. And let me just say that the yellow dots up top and the blue dots down at the bottom represent the charges that are being separated by the application of the electric field. Uh, we can. We, we uh, envision applications in very lightweight defibrillators, uh, power converters in terms of the solar application that I mentioned, and also in electric vehicles. OK, so when we take these materials, these sol gel materials that have silicates in these polar groups, uh, we can do 
pretty well in terms of energy storage. Let me just give you a context. The, the standard in industry for high energy density materials is a form of polypropylene, which uh, is a very common plastic. It's used for squeeze bottles and other things. Uh, and uh, the energy density available commercially from these polypropylene devices are in the range of two to three joules per cubic centimeter. And so what we've been looking at are the fundamental problems that limit that energy density. And, uh, and one of those issues is the injection of charge into our dielectric or capacitor material. And so what we have been experimenting with for about the last two years is uh, the utilization of so-called charge blocking layers, very thin layers, nanoscale layers, that uh, are sort of illustrated here. Our device structure has a, an electrode at the bottom. We have that sol gel material. It's that CNET MS. Uh, and then we have a top barrier layer. And that's where we are putting these charge blocking films. And then on top of that, we put aluminum electrodes. So uh, you can see here they vary in thicknesses from somewhere in the range of a couple of hundred nanometers down to about, let's say, one to two nanometers. Uh, and so uh, these barrier layers function to basically create a big barrier that the charges have, uh, incur when we turn the field on. And in that case, uh, the, the charges actually get blocked from getting into the material. OK. So, so here's uh, how we, we think about these barrier layers. So, so this is a rendition of a self-assembled monolayer. It is got, it's got a group that basically bonds to the silicate material. And uh, it has, on the other side, basically a fatty chain like which would be in uh, like a membrane or some other micell type structure. Uh, the thing that's important is that when you look at the amount of current that can be passed through these layers, as we increase the length of those alkyl chains, uh, we can see that the current takes a big nosedive. It, it decays exponentially as we increase the length of these molecules. And yet they're still only about 2.2 nanometers in width. So that is the basic premise that allows us to mitigate the injection of charges into our dielectrics. So if we had not used these barrier layers, we get charges pushed right into our dielectrics. They get trapped, and they're very difficult to get out. And the extraction efficiency of energy plummets. OK, so I don't want to get into a lot of detail here, but I just want to emphasize a point that uh, when we look at how the, the current uh, scales with electric field, uh, we can see that on the top, that, that black curve is basically just a single layer of the dielectric. And then we've used three other layers that we have put uh, sequentially in between uh, the CNET MS and the electrode. And what you can see is that the uh, black curve is just the bare sol gel material. The red curve illustrates the case where we have that sort of two nanometer blocking layer. And we have also looked at wider blocking layers at 50 and 100 nanometers based on some polymer material. But the thing that I wanted to point out here is that if we look at the permittivity, so 
that's a measure of how polarizable the material is. Uh, and we want that to be high. So we can see the black curve up there is very close to the red curve. But when we use these thicker blocking layers, we see that we start to get a hit in the permittivity, in the, in the polarizability of the material. OK, so the long and the short of it is that this OPA, this octophosphonic acid monolayer that we're using to block the charges to, from getting into the dielectric is critical. And it is also favorable in terms of maintaining a high uh, polarizability of that material. Uh, so we do measurements of these things and the energy densities. So I mentioned before about the commercial standard being two to three joules per cubic centimeter. With these materials, we've been able to achieve energy densities. So if you look at the solid blue curves that go all the way up to 40, that's 40 joules per cubic centimeter of energy storage. And when we look at the energy extraction efficiency, if we uh, go to a voltage or a field that is at about 550, if you can see that on the horizontal axis, and go straight up, you can see that we end up getting about a 90% energy extraction efficiency, which at these high energy densities is uh, unprecedented according to what we know. OK, so to put this into a, a, a little broader context, uh, this is a, a plot that is referred to as a Ragon plot. And it plots energy density versus power density. So, so batteries typically have very high energy densities. And you can see up where it's the Panasonic lithium ion battery. That's like the king of batteries for rechargeables now. Uh, there are some other technologies here represented by the thin film lithium battery. Those are those uh, sort of rust colored uh, triangles. And there's some other technologies here, supercapacitors, uh, electrolytic capacitors. And if you look at it from a, a distance, then what you see is that we have uh, uh, put a black dashed line across the vertical uh, span on the, on the plot to show the energy density that we achieved. And we also plot it going down to show what the power density is. And so what this means is that it, it, was, is a, it, was, it really was a bit of a surprise at how good it was with the power density. Uh, and what we can see is that it exceeds both the lithium thin film battery and any of the electrolytic capacitors. OK, so the features that, that are uh, aside from the energy densities are that we make these materials using primarily solution processing, doing spin coating and very simple processing, very cheap. Uh, there's a lot of potential for tuning the energy storage properties with these different polar groups that we attach in these materials. And, uh, uh, and so then just to summarize, uh, these monolayers of alkyl phosphonic acids are effective in uh, blocking charges. Uh, we've gotten energy densities at uh, 40 joules per cubic centimeter and 3,900 watts per cubic centimeter. And these things can also be uh, mass manufactured on flexible substrates so that you can have uh, lightweight and flexible devices.